revelatory. Transformative. Seminal. Sensational. Emotional. Empathetic. These are just a few descriptions of the work of groundbreaking photojournalist Lewis Hine. With his unique brand of social documentary photography, Lewis Hine captured the harsh reality of hazardous child labor practices in the American progressive era and provoked the American public to speak out against unsafe working conditions and unfair labor standards. Hine's exploration of photojournalism as a tool for social reform provided him with first-hand encounters with child laborers and their struggles. The power of his social documentary work lies in the enormous social impact that resulted from the exchange between Heinz Lens and the American public. Heinz' exposure of abysmal working conditions during the Progressive Era prompted legislators to explore the regulation of labor standards, which was solidified with the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. Every time I close my eyes, I see that picture still. Textile work was carried on with babies in the mill. There is work that profits children, and there is work that brings profit only to employers. As Gilded Age industrialism swept across the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, factory owners began to capitalize on the profitable prospects of employing children. So the industrial system is almost perfect for child labor. They are easily controllable, they will follow orders, they will do repetitive tasks, you don't have to pay them very much, and perhaps most important, they can't unionize. The 1900 census counted 1.75 million individuals aged 10 to 15 who were gainful workers. At that time, these children comprised 6% of the labor force. There were no national laws that governed child labor, and while some states enacted and enforced such laws, most did not. In response to the growing presence of children in the workplace, the National Child Labor Committee was formed in 1904 during Theodore Roosevelt's administration to investigate the scope of the epidemic and to combat further growth of child labor. In 1908, the NCLC hired relatively new photographer Lewis Wicks Hine to explore factories and other industrial workplaces employing children to investigate, expose, and report any hazardous working conditions he encountered. His exchanges with foremen and managers often presented problems or prevented Hine's entrance into such factories. However, Hine often gained admittance to factories under the guise of a machine photographer and covertly recorded his experiences and encounters with young workers on a notepad hidden in his coat pocket. He set his camera up in front of a loom. He'd take his time, the foreman would lose interest. He'd get a little child to stand up next to the loom. He'd have the buttons on his vest measured so that when a child stood next to him, he'd know how tall he was. And then he had a paper and pencil in his pocket so that he could jot down important information as to how long the kid was there, how many hours he worked. Heinz's highly detailed captions gave supporting details and depth to his subjects, highlighting their humanity and sharing their stories. One of the spinners in Whitmill Cotton Mill sometimes works at night. When asked how old she was, she hesitated, then said, I don't remember. Then added confidentially, I'm not old enough to work, but do just the same. Whitmill, North Carolina. Hine published his findings in progressive publications like the Charities and Commons, later known as the Survey Graphic. Middle-class Americans, whose children were rarely exposed to the harsh conditions of mills, mines, and factories, were horrified by the hazardous conditions in which Hine's subjects labored. Images of industrial machinery towering over small children, young boys covered in soot from coal mines, and teenagers missing fingers, hands, or even arms shocked the public and incited a call for change. What Hyde wanted to do was to change the average American's mind about child labor. And the way to do that is to publicize it by taking as many pictures as he could and by showing these pictures to the American middle class public, people who wore white collars and not blue collars, and people who might not know much about child labor that was almost beneath their feet. Hine recognized the need for visual evidence of the horrors of child labor and realized the power of his documentary photographs. 
He aimed not only to promote better working conditions for all laborers, but also to emphasize the dignity and the humanity of workers, which was best accomplished in Hines' unique brand of photojournalism, the social documentary genre. It is only in this way that I can illustrate my thesis that the human spirit is the big thing after all. Hein developed specific methods of composition to best convey the emotion of his subjects to his viewers. A common theme in Hein's work is the connection of subject and viewer through eye contact. The people in the photographs communicate directly to us as if they were still alive. They spill out of their historic reality to become part of our present. Hein recognized the potential of his emotional photographs to push towards safer labor standards. I am sure I am right in my choice of work. My child labor photos have already set the authorities to work to see if such things can be possible. Hines' images resonated with lawmakers, and with the support of fellow progressive activists, child labor legislation seemed, for the first time, an attainable goal. The Keating Owen Act was proposed by Senator Albert H. Beveridge to regulate child labor through interstate commerce. So in 1916, the Keating Owen Act said that goods made by children could not cross state lines, and that was the hallmark victory for this legislation. However, in 1918, its constitutionality was questioned by Roland H. Dagenhart, the father of a young boy who depended on his son's income. The Supreme Court overturned the act on the grounds that it overstepped the government's regulatory powers and imposed on states' rights to regulate in-state labor. While the Keating Own Act was unsuccessful, Lewis Hines' photographs undeniably started the dialogue that ultimately led to the passage of another, more successful piece of legislation, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. The FLSA was an ambitious bill that aimed to right many of the wrongs of American industry, including the creation of minimum wage and maximum working hours, the prohibition of gender discrimination, and the abolition of child labor. Passed just two years before Hines' death in 1940, the Fair Labor Standards Act represented the realization of Lewis Hines' goals and a turning point in American perceptions of child labor. He lived to see that Fair Labor Standards Act pass, and that law could have had his name on it, because no one else did more to help pass that law than Lewis Hines did. By 1918, all states in the U.S. had compulsory education laws, but did not strictly enforce them until the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act. In 1941, the Supreme Court reversed its decision on the Keating Owen Act, upholding the constitutionality of the original act and illustrating the shift in perception of child labor as a result of Lewis Hines' photography and progressive era ideals. Lawmakers continued to ensure the prevention of child labor through updates to the Fair Labor Standards Act in the years following its passage. As the social documentary genre gained popularity, photographers who practiced it began exchanging ideas and methods, explaining the similarities between the work of Hine and his 1930s contemporaries like Ben Sean and Dorothea Lang, and fellow photographers who survived him, including Paul Strand. Sean and Lang, both photojournalists during the Great Depression, filled their frames with similar subjects and compositions reminiscent of Hine's Ellis Island work, the precursor to his famous studies of child labor. Strand studied under Hine at the Ethical Culture School and had a similarly lengthy career, spanning into the 1950s. Hine's influence on Strand's career is especially evident in the portraiture of the two photographers. Hine's legacy continues to inspire modern-day social documentary photographers, such as Dr. David Parker, who jokes that he may be the reincarnation of Lewis Hine. Parker travels to countries like Bangladesh and Nepal to document children working in conditions comparable to the hazardous scenes Hine encountered in 20th century America. I took a trip to Nepal and I went to some carpet factories and thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is going on in the world today. In the words of Jeffrey Newman, the current president of the National Child Labor Committee, Lewis Hine's images and work triggered a worldwide consciousness of the dangers of child labor. Without Lewis Hine, the NCLC's work never would have succeeded. Lewis Hine's exploration of child labor in the progressive era helped pioneer the social documentary genre. Since its creation, photographs have proven powerful tools to right the wrongs of society. Hein recognized the emotional impact his images had on middle-class families and their potential to incite change within American industry. Roy Stryker, who led the Farm Security Administration documentary photography movement, recognized the social and historical significance of Hein's work, writing in 1939, His pictures are bound to take a more important place in the history of American photography and as a part of the history of America. I know 
sure you're glad that things have changed as we go in and do the jobs that babies used to run.